G'day and welcome back to yet another episode of Tommy's Tune-Ups. Well, it has been quite some time since we did any work to the 1275 engine that we built many, many months ago. So as you've seen in previous series, we have built the engine, done the gearbox, done the clutch, we've done front suspension, we've done a brake disc conversion, and now it's time to finally, now that we have the rear subframe, it's all powder coated, it's finally time to start the reassembly of the rear brakes and the rear suspension. So welcome back to the channel everyone. I'm really glad to be announcing that we're finally getting back onto the 1275 build of the Morris Mini panel van that we're gonna be building. So in this episode, we are gonna be going through this box of goodies. I have a heap of stuff. I got some trailing arms that have been painted. We're gonna be reaming those. Um, and if you haven't already, make sure you check it out in the description above as well on how to do that. Uh, we're going to be running through how to assemble the entire rear end. Um, in the box, we also have some brake hose as well. We got a heap of bolts, filters and stuff. Uh, we have pipes, we have some rubber cones, which we've spoken plenty about before as well. Uh, we have wheel cylinders, we got brake valves, we got everything. So let's get cracking on this thing. Let's get this thing back together. All right, so we are gonna start off by using the freshly powder coated rear trailing arms. We're going to ream it, which you've already seen in the video listed above, uh, but also fitting a new rear axle shaft as well. So that'll come through here. Uh, essentially, these are coated left and right. So on the left-hand side, you have a left-handed nut on the axle nut, and on the right-hand side, you have a right-handed thread, so a standard style thread. So it is worth noting to make sure that you get them right. It's not probably gonna matter too much if you get the sides mixed up in terms of the axle shaft. Uh, it'll probably just mean that you get it wrong and you just have the opposite to what everyone else has, but these will only go in one side. So the question is, which way does this go? Well, let's go in and let's explore it. All right, so we're just going to start off by placing all the parts on the bench and then just going through them all and seeing what it is we have. We have a couple of trailing arms, got a heap of brake pipes, so we'll just stick those off to the side. We have rubber cones and they are the red dot cones as well. All right, so we have some rear trunnions, that's what mounts the uh, subframe to the body. We have an adjustable um, engine steady bar. That was something the customer specifically asked for. Got a couple of new clevis pins to hold the uh, trailing arm quadrants in on there. All right, so you got a heap of parts. Uh, they're also part of the trunnions as well. I think that goes on the front or the rear subframe, I believe, from memory. Nut, bolts, washers, pretty much everything in there we're gonna need to mount it. We've got an axle nut and that is coated either left or right-handed thread. A couple more brake pipes. We got the uh, stub axle shaft, another brake pipe. Uh, we got some rear drum screws, always handy to have. Uh, and that one, we got a circlip. I think that's what holds the axle in. Yeah, it is. I didn't actually pull these old ones out. The customer, Mark, pulled them out, so it'll be interesting to see. Got a uh, really cool tool, the rear wheel cylinder tool. If you haven't already, make sure you check that out in the link in the description above what it is and what it does. Another stub axle. Uh, we have the rear radius uh, repair kit. So we have a new, new shaft, um, washers, uh, spring washers, nuts, uh, bush, and there'll be a bearing on the shaft there somewhere as well. So we'll have two of those. This is great. I completely forgot we had all of this stuff. Uh, we've got another repair kit. Uh, got a couple of washers. They go on the ends of the stub axle nuts on here. Um, some exhaust mounts. So one of those is actually for my car. Uh, we have an axle nut as well. Uh, clevis pin that goes on the retaining bracket for the drum. So where the handbrake uh, cable actually goes in, that's what retains it. 
Probably need to get some arc clips for those as well. Uh, we have some rear subframe uh, bushes, which I think we're actually gonna be upgrading to Nolithane. Uh, they did come in a kit. Now, a lot of these I did buy from Mini Spares in the UK only because majority of this stuff um, isn't available in Australia. Like obviously the repair kits, the stub axles, all that sort of stuff. Uh, but it was easier at the time, and this was before I got the sponsorship with Minisport. So, Andrew, um, I, I do apologise for not using you guys. Um, a lot of this stuff came as a kit, and it was at a you know fairly decent price, so that's why I ordered. And as I said, I hadn't got the sponsorship from Minisport. So there's a heap of bushes we're going to be replacing. Um, we got even more um, bolts for the rear handbrake um, assembly. Some of these might actually be for my car, but we'll find out soon enough. All right, so we got in here as well. Yeah, this is literally like Christmas, eh? Like anyone that's opened parts for a classic Mini or even just any sort of car, when you're buying stuff like this, um, you know, to have this sort of stuff available to you and just come in a box, man, it's just, it's amazing, love it. I'll just angle that camera up a bit more so you can actually see my pretty face. Uh, we have a set of rip speed hilos as well. So those will be fitting, which I've spoken about in many episodes before. And these have the drain plug as well, as you can see where my finger is. And make sure as well, you just absolutely cake them in grease when you fit them. They also do come with new cups as well. So they're a wear and tear item and they're a serviceable item as well. So they're cheap enough, you might as well replace them. If you're doing a suspension, you might as well just replace these because they do wear. <laughs> All right, so we've got the rear reaming tool, which I'll run through that with you guys later, or in an episode listed above as well. Uh, in this one, we have a set of rear shoes. So not the shoes that you put in your feet, but uh, brake shoes. Okay, so you'll probably find, yeah, so there's a heap of boxes that are the same. Uh, these will be the rear wheel cylinders. As you can see, got a couple of those as well. They do have a circlip and you guys will see that in the episode of what that is and what that does, why you need to use it. So we do have uh, a few of those. I think from memory, I may have ordered extra parts. It's always good to have spares um, from mini spares, no pun intended. Now we also have a new brake pressure regulator and it does exactly that. It regulates the brake pressure. Now, why do we need to regulate brake pressure? Well. Let's imagine you're riding a push bike, for example. You're riding down the road, someone pulls out in front of you and you just grab the front brake and you just squeeze that thing as hard as you possibly can. What do you think is gonna happen? You're gonna go head over turkey, you're gonna <whistles> down the road, bang, see you later. So what this does is it enables the brake pressure to be, depending on the style of setup you have, a brake pressure adjustment. So this one is, I believe, non-adjustable. I'll just quickly double check. But it enables the brake pressure to be split front to rear. So that way you're not gonna lock up the rear, but you're also not gonna lock up the front. So that's it there. It's got a valve inside it. It enables the pressure to be regulated both front and rear. That actually mounts the rear subframe. That's why that's like that. It does have a thread in there as well. So that's hard mounted. Some of them do have an adjustment, um, I believe in this end. Someone can probably comment in the section below, but that is a super, super, super handy part to have. And it's something that you can uh, rebuild by the look of it. It does have a nut at the end. So you could probably pull this all apart and buy a rebuild kit for it. But for what it's worth, you might as well replace it. Uh, if you're doing sort of race applications, you'd probably want something to be adjustable. That way you can kind of help tailor the braking efficiency, depending on what uh, circuit you're doing, what sort of racing you're doing. That way you can get the maximum efficiency out of it. So you can actually buy one from CAD um, Racing Developments. Uh, they do sell one that's a bias valve that has um, two adjustments so you can adjust how much is at the front and rear. And that's what we're gonna run on this thing. We were gonna run a uh, e-brake setup, but we decided not to. Uh, it would have been really cool to do. There's little to no kits um, worldwide that have actually had it. Uh, the reason why we didn't is, well, money and the whole um, conversion kit. Essentially, we have to convert it to a disc brake, which would have been fine to do at the rear, uh, but then also run a separate handbrake. So we would have had a big lever, which would have been really mad to run, um, especially when you're driving a classic Mini, it would have been really good for handbrake turns, but for what we're actually doing in the car and for what he's gonna be doing, it didn't really suit the application, nor did it suit 
uh, the style of driving that he wanted to do. It would have been really cool to have this big handbrake lever there, but it literally just snowballed from us, you know, buying this kit, which I actually rang the guys in the UK and, and spoke to them about it. There was less than, I think, six kits produced worldwide that they'd actually sold. And simply because it was designed for motor car racing, which is, you know, small circuit racing stuff like grass events, all that sort of thing. I think everyone in the world calls it something else. So we looked into it and we just decided it's probably not gonna be the best thing for what we wanted to do, simply because it didn't really fit in with the build nor did it fit in with the budget. Uh, but yeah, it just didn't work in with it. So yeah, going back to that, um, a, a valve in which enables the um, brake fluid to be distributed um, or proportioned evenly. So yeah, we're gonna go back through and we're gonna start assembling all of these, um, the components of the rear trailing arms, and then we're gonna jump straight into it and start rebuilding it. Also, we do have a new shoe adjuster as well. That's really cool. And we do have two of these little feet as well. That's what acts on the uh, bottom of the shoe, I believe. So we do have more parts, I'll just have to find where they are, but let's get straight into it. We probably spent long enough talking about this, so we'll probably end up making this into a bit of a two-part series. So let's jump into it. All right, so first thing we need to know is which side is which. Well, essentially, the stub axle and these bolts want to be facing outward, so that's where the wheel is going to be mounting. So we know that this one, just by looking at it here, so you can see the cup is on the inside, and there's nothing on the outside this is facing outwards. That way we know that this is facing outwards, therefore it's gonna be the left-hand side. So what we need to now do is get the stub axle, the nut and the circlip and fit it to the rear trailing arm. All right, so it is worthwhile noting that, like I said before, the stub axle shafts are coated left and right. This one, it has radius arm stub axle, dry suspension. So obviously left and right are not only different, but also dry and wet suspension. So if anyone has any more details on that as to why the stub axle is different on a hydroelastic suspension uh, compared to a dry, I would love to know. So we're gonna go open that and we should be able to fit it. Now, I did just notice that it actually comes with a circlip at the end. So we don't actually have to replace it. So these, like I said before, always good to have spares. Because I didn't remove this out of the car, I'm just gonna wing this as to how it actually goes in. So what I'm gonna guess here is it's gonna come in from behind there. Because it's also been powder coated, we just have to keep in mind that there could be a little bit of uh, burrs on the inner edge. So what I'm gonna do is just grab a little bit of emery cloth and just clean that up, and then we should be able to drive it straight in. All right, so just grab the emery cloth. Just gonna clean that up on the inside, just to enable it to mount properly and just go in. Yeah, there we go. So there's a little bit of burr on there. You can see how shiny that is now. So we'll just do the other side. You gotta remember as well that grease is gonna travel all the way up through here as well as through the arm. It's gonna help lubricate everything. That's why it's all open down on the inside here. Now that's done, I'm gonna grab it. Hopefully we can just drive it home. Now what I'm actually gonna do here is, cause that is gonna be quite stiff, I would imagine to get in if I can't just twist it in there. Okay, yeah, that's gonna be stiff. What we're gonna do, I'm gonna grab a dead boy hammer. I'm just gonna give it a bit of a tap just to try and get it in. Now it is worthwhile noticing as well that you have the smaller stud facing outwards, so towards the inside of the car, that's where the lower shock bolts onto, and then the outside is where the wheel is gonna bolt onto. I'm actually gonna put this in the vise and we can hit it with the hammer, that way you don't have to try and hold it and push it and press it all at the same time. <laughs> So yes, as you can see, my workbench is a bit of a mess at the moment. I've got everything sitting there from every project we've got going on. So because it's been powder coated, even if it hadn't been, we just want to make sure we don't destroy the component itself. Hence the reason why I've got a rag sitting down in there. So I'm just going to clamp that in there just so it holds it. And then we should be able to grab the hammer and give it a bit of a hit. What I'm going to do is be able to get it in there 
and drive it all the way home. Actually, what we might do is we're gonna stick it in the press. I could probably keep hitting it, but it is getting late at night and I don't wanna be waking up my son, so let's just stick it in the press. Now, it just goes to show you this is how prepared I am that I don't even set up the scenario in which I'm doing and, you know, I go from one tool bench to another, to the vise, to the press, rookie. All right, so what I've done is I've just grabbed a couple of the steel plates. I've grabbed a deep, uh, that's a 36 mil half inch socket. That's gonna sit directly in there. We might just try and raise it up just a little bit more if we can, depending how much room we have. If not, that's fine. And then we're just gonna drive it home using the press. And then just nice and easy, we're gonna push it in. Now, you need to be super careful doing this. But also, not just that, but we need to not push it too far. So as it starts to get in, we need to make sure that we get it all the way down to the bottom and it's not going to bottom out inside the socket. And if it is, then we need to work out how we need to prevent it bottoming out. So just nice and easy. Just give it a good couple of pumps. Now it should have a fair amount of length inside there as well. So you shouldn't have any dramas. If it does start to build up any sort of pressure, you wanna make sure that you just back it off nice and easy and that you can get it lined up into where you need it to be. Deal's pretty firm now. I reckon that's starting to just bottom out. So I'm gonna loosen that off. Almost all the way home, I reckon, yeah. Couple more hits and that should be in there, I reckon. I'd be pretty confident to say that. So what we might try and do is just try and find something else in which we can use to lift it up a little bit further to be able to get it through uh, and home all the way. All right, so what I'm actually gonna do here is I'm gonna use these, sit it like that, put the arm in the middle, and then we're just gonna push directly down on there. That'll just give us that little bit of extra length that we need. We just have to make sure that we adjust the, well, press to the right height, and then we should be fine to just press it all the way home, I reckon. Put that in the middle. Aha, uh -huh, perfect. So you could probably even just do this moving forward before you do the other side. So once again, just nice and easy. Just want to be able to drive it. So you see, see it seat up against the edge. So see how much further that's gone in. Yep, so I can start to feel resistance. That is locked and loaded, that is home. So that's one part of the installation done. Next thing we're gonna do is we are going to install the backing plate, the bolts, and start building the rear brakes. Actually, change of plan, let's go ahead and ream the rear trailing arms. Now, this is something you guys have seen me do before, and if you haven't, make sure to check it out in the video listed above. It is something that you may do oh, quite a lot. You may only do every now and again. You might only ever do it once. So it's not really a tool that you really need to be concerned about buying. If you're able to borrow it from someone or you're able to pay someone, like Leo, for instance, to ream it for you, probably a better idea. It is quite expensive, and if yeah, you're only really using it once, it doesn't really pay for itself. So I took the liberty and thought, you know what, I might as well invest in it. I've done enough now where I've borrowed uh, people's tools, and I'd much prefer to be able to do it myself. So what I'm gonna do is I'll quickly ream these. Next scene, we will keep the reassembly process going. Mm -hmm. 